I'll figure out where to put this. Okay, so for the resistor, basically, these are lossy devices. And as you know, the loss will be related to the square of the current and the resistance. So if I'm, especially if, I, if I'm looking at large values of current, then the power loss will be significant. So for any device, using any kind of resistor will mean that I'm lowering the power efficiency. And so we should avoid them every time, anytime we can. So we avoid using resistors directly, but like I said, the resistance will be there. So you'll have some resistance in the capacitors, you'll have some resistance in the inductors, you'll have some resistance in the transistors and those devices. So we can try to minimize them within those systems, but that resistance will be there. So the ideal thing is make sure you don't use any resistors in your device. So if I'm building a rectifier, then I don't want any resistors within the rectifier itself. So the resistor can end up being the load, but it can't be part of uh, my power converter or rectifier, for instance. You can't have them directly within the system because they'll heat up and then you'll basically they'll waste power. So avoid the resistors, don't use resistors. We'll just sort of have to do with what we end up with, which is so resi the resistance that will be the series resistance in the inductor. Um, we'll see with active devices also, they have some resistance in them. And so for the active devices, and so active devices, in this case, I'm really talking about the semiconductors, who basically, um, diodes, transistors, and the other, the other ones called thyristors that we'll look at later on. So if I use sort of um, this idea of, um, say that BJT, for instance, BJT has sort of an active region. So it's what I'm calling a linear region. So that region is generally going to be a lossy region. So anytime, sorry. So it has this region where everything is lossy. So for instance, you're trying to sort of operate it as an amplifier, as a linear amplifier, class A amplifier. So in that case, this will be lossy. So you will lose some power because if you're operating at, sort of in, so for BJT, if you try to operate within the active region. So what you need to do is, act, is operate, operate it in the switch mode. So switch mode means that I'm oper for BJT, for instance, I'm operating either in the cutoff region. So it's either cutoff region or it's in saturation region. So I've got to, so either I'm getting maximum amount of amount a maximum amount of current flowing with a very small saturation voltage, or I'm getting no current at all. So it's either fully on or off. It's not anywhere in between. So in between is that sort of active region for a BJT. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so this is something similar to what you see for a power amplifier that if i want to build a power amplifier i want to do something like class b and class b means that basically either it's saturation or it's in cutoff it's not in the active region because active region is lossy so basically avoid that region so even when we look at the active devices we have to make sure that we operate them as switches. So it's either on maximum current flow and very small voltage drop, 
or it's totally off and there's hardly any current flowing. So we'll go into this a bit more. So we'll see what this means. Um, okay, so that idea of having this device behave like a switch. So if I'm looking at a transistor, I want it to be either on. So the on is, in this case, I'm showing it as fully closed. So the switch is closed. So for a BJT, that means fully saturated. So I'm acting in a saturation region. Or I want it to be off. And so this is open. So for a BJT, this would be cut off. No current can flow. There's a voltage across the terminals. So as a way to sort of um, compare compare devices, um, we sort of come up with this idea of an ideal switch. So what are sort of the ideal characteristics that would want? So we saw this with our uh, op-amps. So we talk about the ideal op-amp for instance, and say, okay, ideal op-amp has infinite gain, um, those kinds of things. So even with a switch, so if you're operating a transistor or any of those devices as ideal switches, then their behaviors would like. So for instance, if that device is open or off, one, we don't expect any current to flow through it. So I'd expect the current flowing through. So this, I would expect this current to be zero. So that's one condition. So when it's open or off, this current is equal to zero. On the other hand, this voltage, it should be able to block an infinite voltage. So for instance, it means I should be able to apply a thousand volts across this terminal, the terminals of the switch, and nothing will happen. So I can apply a thousand volts, I can apply 10 million volts. So I can apply infinite, an infinite voltage across these terminals and no current will flow or the, the switch will not fail. So those are some of the conditions. So those are two of the conditions for when this is open. When it's closed or when the switch is on, then I would expect a very, I should, it should be able to handle an infinite amount of current. So not large current, but infinite amount of current. So again, remember we're talking about idea. So we talk about infinite sort of quantities. So it should be able to handle an infinite amount of current, should be able to flow through that switch. And then this voltage should drop to zero. So I don't want any voltage drop across this terminal. So conditions we've talked about in terms of voltages and currents, we've said in this case, current is infinite, but voltage is zero, which means if I multiply the voltage by the current, that is zero. So I'm sort of multiplying a zero by an, an infinite value and I'm getting zero, meaning that when this is on, the power being dissipated within the switch is zero. Same thing applies in this case that I've got a zero current flowing, but a, an infinite amount of voltage. So again, zero power losses. So there are no power losses when it's on or when it's off. So this switch doesn't dissipate any part or so it never heats up. Then the other issue is that it should switch instantaneously. So I can switch it on and off instantaneously. It doesn't take any time to go from on to off. So that is infinite value. Then it shouldn't wear out. So it never wears out. Um, it just keeps working basically. So those are sort of the ideal things would want 
in a switch. In practice, what we end up with is a switch that sort of, um, depending of course on which device, but they're all lost. So we always dissipate some power. And the reason you dissipate power is because one, even when their switch is off, especially the electronic switches, you have a small amount of current flowing. So even when it's off, you have a little bit of current. So you have a voltage and a current, so there'll be some power dissipation. So imagine a diode that even when that diode is off, there's that small leakage current, small but not zero. So that small leakage current times whatever voltage you have across the terminals of that diode, then there'll be some power dissipation. Same thing when it's running. So when it's forward biased, then you still have a small forward voltage. So there's a small voltage drop and then there's a large current flowing through that diode, for instance. So when it's on or when it's off, you will still have some power being dissipated, which means you, you need to have a heat sink every time you run these devices. Plus the hand of finite, a finite amount of current, and then they block a, a finite voltage. So, um, most cases you can't just apply 10 kilovolts across the terminals of a random diode, it will probably fail if the voltage across it. If you have a negative voltage, you're trying to run it as a rectifier, and then you have a negative voltage of 10,000 kilovolts, your diode will probably fail or if you try to run a very large amount of current, 100 kilo amps through that diode, it will probably fail. So the, so the power devices can handle large currents and block large voltages, but they won't be infinite. So that's one of the difference. And because of that, they'll be lossy. So they never, completely switch off or switch on. So, there are, so there's always some power dissipation. Then the other bit is that the switching is finite. So you can't go from on to off or off to on instantaneously. It takes some time. So we'll see that it could be just a few nanoseconds or microseconds or even milliseconds but it does take time to go from one state to another. So from on to off or from off to on. And so because it's switching between those states, so as it switches between the states, then it's not really off or really on. It's not fully off or fully off. So because of that, as it switches, there are losses. So we're talking about power losses. So anytime I talk, I, I talk about this, I'm really talking about power losses. So as it switches from one set to another, there are power losses because the voltage and current are not really zero because it's not totally on and it's not totally off. So you have a voltage and a current, which means you have a power that is being dissipated within your device, within your resistor, within your diode, within your transistor, within um, the thyristor. We'll talk about the thyristors later. So this is part of what I'll see. Then of course they do wear out. So they wear out, um, they, they don't run forever. I didn't include that. And they're definitely um, environmental, con they are sensitive to environmental conditions. So there's a limit to how hot this can be. So um, the, the manufacturer will always tell you what temperatures this can operate at. So for instance, if it's too hot or if it's too cold, 
then many devices will fail also, just because of that. So if I'm going to operate this within, if it's an ice or if it's, you know, a very hot environment, if you're going to operate in a car, for instance, car engine, then you have to make sure that your device doesn't become very hot because the engine itself is going to be hot. So you need to find a way to protect your device from getting all this external heat from the engine, for instance. So whenever these devices are used, for instance, in a car engine or a truck engine or an aircraft engine, you always have to, to, to find a way to sort of keep them cool. Otherwise they'll fail. So there are a bunch of ways these things can fail. So make sure you look for as many as possible. Um, wait. Any questions on this, by the way? I'm not getting any questions, which is strange. Okay, so I guess these are sort of easy things to understand. That's why I'm not getting any questions. Okay, so the other bit, so let's see. So um, generally, um, I don't really talk so much about the mechanical switches. So most of the emphasis is on those electronic switches or even the electromagnetic switches. So the electromagnetic switches, especially the relays, for instance. So some of the questions I do ask about um, are for people to be able to compare that too. So you, you look at the advantages and disadvantages of a mechanical switch versus an electronic switch, or for instance, what else? Or electromagnetic switch, like a relay versus an electronic switch. So transistor versus maybe an electromagnetic relay. So how do those two compare in terms of advantages and disadvantages? So this you'll review on your own, but um, something I must specify is that the comparison has to be for things that are equivalent, right? So um, if I'm going to compare a relay, an electromagnetic, electromagnetic relay to a diode or say BJT transistor, then this has to be similar. So similar as in say, they both can handle 10 amps. So I want to compare a 10 amp electromagnetic relay to a 10 amp uh, BJT. So that you must specify, it has to be things that are similar. Don't compare um, a diode that can only handle one amp to a relay that can handle 10 amps. That's not a fair comparison. And so I'll generally not accept that sort of, um, so if you're talking about advantages, disadvantages, right? generally that is not really a good comparison. If things are very, very different. So you, you don't compare a tiny, tiny diode that you'd find in, um, a radio to, for instance, to the kind of switch, a light switch, a light switch that can handle 13, 13 amps. So you can't compare that to that small milliamp type diode. It's not a fair comparison. So make sure you're comparing things that are, that are relatively similar. So that's one area where people get into, I, I get issues. Okay. So that's one area where I get issues. Oh, oh so I hope people can hear. So let's see. So is that clear? 
Maybe people can't hear. Maybe that's where I'm not getting. Let's see. Let's see. So. So. I hope people can hear what I'm saying. Otherwise, I may be talking to myself. Maybe not. Okay, okay. So you can hear what I'm saying. Okay. Um, okay, so. Again, when we talk about switching, especially these electronic switches, so the transistors, the diodes, um, the thyristors that we'll talk about later, then we can also categorize them based on the way that they are controlled. So we have basically three main categories. So the first category, are the uncontrolled switches. So by uncontrolled, I'm talking about something like a diode that, so for a diode, there are only two terminals. So I can't, I don't have, you don't have this other terminal that you can use to switch a diode on or off. They're just two diodes, sorry, they're just two terminals. So you have the anode and cathode for that uncontrolled switch. So the only way you can sort of switch off the diode is to have the voltage go negative. And the only way you can sort of have it switch on is to have a positive voltage that is larger than say 0 0.7 or for the smaller ones and maybe one volt. That's the only way that you can sort of control it. So you're not, Actually, you don't have a, a separate terminal that you can use to control that diode. You just have to use external sources. So you can only control it through the voltage source by having it go positive or negative, or maybe some extent the load, the kind of load you're running, that can also have some effect on that. Then at the other extreme, you have a switch that is fully controlled. And an example of a fully controlled switch would be a transistor. So the most obvious one being the BJT transistor that I have current running from the collector into the emitter, right? So most of the time, that's sort of what I'm looking at. Current flows from the collector into the emitter. And so I can control that using the base. So I can apply a positive current into the base. I'm assuming it's an NPN. So if there's current flowing through the base, then if it's every, if it's real, if it's forward biased, um, the base emitter is forward biased. Eh? And I have a bit of a current flowing into, or a sufficient large current flowing into the base, then this will the transistor will switch on. If I remove the base current, the transistor will go off. I wonder if, if I have okay, I don't have it in here. I thought I did. So in another one. Okay. So so with transistors, we can control them. There's an, a third terminal, which for a budget is called a base terminal, which I can use to switch it on or switch it off. So I hope that's clear that unlike the diode, which is a two terminal device, with a diode, there's no control. I can't control it directly. With a transistor, I can control the transistor directly using that third terminal called the base terminal. 
So if I'm looking at a MOSFET, for a MOSFET, you have that gate, or for the FETs generally, the field electric transistors, then you have a gate terminal that you can use to switch the device on or off. So you have full control of the device itself. For diode, you don't have. Then in between, there's this, um, the, the so-called silicon control rectifiers or SCRs. So with these ones, you have a third terminal that you can use to control. Um, but in this case, the control is limited. So the control is limited to you being able to switch it on. So when you switch it on, so if you give it a, a certain amount of current, then it will latch on and then it will stay on even if you remove the current that you applied initially, it will just latch on and stay on. So to switch it off, then you probably have to do sort of the same things you do with a diode to switch it off. So try to get a negative voltage or some apply a negative voltage to terminals or some other things that we'll see. So with this SCR, it's a kind of thyristor you have, you can switch it on, but you can't use that same terminal to switch it off. So that's why they, we talk about having this idea of having semi-control or half control. So you can just switch it on, but you cannot switch it off directly. But this is also a three terminal device. So the only single terminal device, two terminal devices are basically the diodes. These are the transistors, and the uh, SCRs all have three terminals. So that gives you some control using the third terminal. Okay. Um, so I hope that sort of makes some sense. Okay, then, so we can start looking at the first device we have out there. Um, and that's a power diode. Okay, and as I've said, so the diodes you've seen before, as I've mentioned, this is an uncontrolled device. So you have just these two terminals. Um, you don't have a third terminal out here that you can use to control this device. So you want it to switch on or off, then you're using a, whatever voltage source you're applying that will control whether it's on or off. So also it's the other terminology you'll see is that it's a unidirectional, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Okay. So in terms of terminology, the other thing you will hear is it being referred to as a unidirectional current switch. So generally you are saying that the current you're operating, you want to operate it in such a way that current flows in one direction. So ideally, so that current just flows from the anode to the cathode. So you have unidirection. So generally you don't want to operate it in such a way that current is flowing from the cathode to the anode. That would sort of, it would block that current anyway. So current flows in one direction. Then in terms of blocking voltages, it can block, it mainly blocks negative currents. So if I'm coming in with a sinusoid, so when anytime I get the voltage goes negative, it will block that voltage. So it's basically to a large extent blocking negative currents. If the voltage is positive, that's no problem. 
So current flows in one direction and then it blocks negative voltages. So then those are classified, the diodes are class classified sort of in two ways. You have the low power diodes that, um, so basically up to now you've really been talking about um, the kinds of things I said you'd find in a small radio, small battery, a portable radio that operates on a battery or something like that. The kinds of things, um, mainly the communication, so the communications people would use. So that would generally be a low power diode. So a signal diode sometimes is called. And with that, you just have a normal PN junction. So you have two regions that are relatively evenly doped, so P and N. So what changes when we want to handle large currents, so to be called a power diode, then this N region, what will happen is that the, you'll, the doping, the concentration of the doping will be different. So near the PN junction, you have a lightly doped in layer and then sort of at the edge or not at the edge, but at the other side, what we have is a highly doped region. So as from what you can see, the difference really is in the concentrations of the doping. So what we have, what is sort of unique is that you have this lightly doped area and so lightly doped means that it sort of behaves like most of the time it's going to behave like a, a relatively good insulator because lightly doping means you have just a few a few a number of electrons that are available to move charges around so if you have really few electrons then that free few free electrons that means you're talking about basically something that looks like an insulator. So that's the difference between the setup. It's this layer in between. So that doping, the concentration that is slightly doped, then there's also be a difference in basically the architecture. We'll say the architecture a bit, um, so-called vertical structure, but the first thing you'd notice is this bit. So, and this exists to enable you to be able to block a large voltage. <clears throat> so for a small low power signal, I may decide that I want to just block minus five volts. So if I have minus five volts, then no current can flow. On the other end, so I can, this, this can go to say minus five volts, without breaking down. Um, so minus five volts would not be sufficient for a high power device. So for a high power device, for instance, I may want this to go up to something like um, 350 volts minus. So if I wanted this to be able to block minus 350 volts, which is a peak voltage that you'd probably see in a normal, so a normal basically outlet. So if I'm looking at an outlet, a socket in my house, then an AC socket in my house would definitely at some point, that value goes to maybe minus 360, even minus 400 volts. So I want a diode that I can apply minus 400 volts sorry, to which I can apply minus 350 volts without breaking down. So it's breakdown region when I have that minus voltage is much larger than what I have with these low power devices. So that's sort of the idea. So if you think of your charger, for instance, that diode in your charger, remember it goes through, through the rectification it goes through basically, okay. It, it goes through a transformer. 
So although you're starting out with maybe a peak voltage of 300 volts AC, by the time that gets to the rectifiers, the diodes, then that voltage may be down to 20 volts. So these may be blocking maybe 20 volts max. So that is a small voltage block, minus 20 volts. So these devices, so for some of them, can block up to a thousand volts. So minus one kilovolt applied to these terminals and it doesn't break down. And so to be able to do that kind of thing, one of the things that is done is to have a sort of, to change the way that doping is done, to have this lightly doped area. So this helps me block very, very large voltages, very large negative voltages. So this is a key difference you'll see between these two. So if somebody asks one of the difference, it will, one of the differences, this will be it. There are some other differences that we'll look at, but this is one of them. So you have this slightly doped in area to help you block. So the more lightly doped it is, that the smaller the concentration, the more it will be able to block, the larger the voltage it will block. Then its size also matters. So its width will also be relatively large. So like I said, what I'm trying to, what you're trying to create is something that is, that behaves like an insulator. So I want it to have very few mobile electrons, just as you'd have in an insulator. So if I'm looking at a piece of wood, so for a piece of wood, there are hard, any moving, any mobile electrons in a piece of wood. That's why a piece of wood is such a good insulator. There are hardly any free electrons. And then the same thing would happen that generally, yeah, if it's a larger piece of wood, it will also be probably if I had a small. Okay, I don't know who's, where's that sound coming from. I'll just mute everybody. Okay, so then the thickness of this layer. So like I said, a larger piece of wood would be a better insulator than a tiny piece of wood. So I don't know if I don't see any hands up, so, okay. So that layer is very important. So let's see if I can go back a bit. Okay, so the other, so let's see. So these are some of the points. So we want the device to act like a conductor when it's on, that is, so that we have maximum current flow with very, with basically no voltage drop. So that would mean if I multiply the current by the voltage, then I get a power dissipation of zero. So ideally I want, zero power dissipation. Then we want the device to act like an insulator when it's off, zero current flow and a large negative voltage. Again, when I multiply the current and the voltage, I end up with zero. And so there's no power dissipation. So power doesn't get dissipated when the device is on or when the device is off. So those are sort of some of the conditions I want. Um, I want, but I said I want a large current, large current and large voltage. So that way I can talk about this being a power device. So I can connect basically this directly to my socket, my wall socket. So then ideally I want to be able to switch um, instantaneously. I can't do instantaneous switching but I want it to switch very quickly from one state to, to the other, from the on state to the off state, or from the off state to the on state very quickly. So when I, so that way, if it's, so as long as, as, almost as soon as it goes from positive to negative, I want it to go off. So 
we say in practice it's not instantaneous, but it's relatively fast. And the reason I want that to happen quickly is because as long as it's basically within that transition between on and off or off and on, there's participation. So you have a voltage and current as it's switching between those two states on and off. So you have these switching losses. So as long as the switching is relatively slow, then the losses are relatively high. That's sort of one way to think about it. So I want to minimize, I want those switching losses to be almost zero. And remember what I said, every time I sort of talk about losses, I'm really talking about these power losses. So I won't always talk about power losses, but that's what I really mean for basically all these cases. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, I'll assume that that is understood. Okay, so let's look at some of this physics, a little bit of the physics. Um, again, what I sort of do is I limit um, the, the physics to sort of the basic things we'll need to understand how this works. So I don't go into as much detail as you would in say your first electronics class. So um, I won't go into any of those equations that basically you look at when you're doing your first electronics class because we just need enough information to be able to use these, these devices to build our basically power converters, to build the rectifiers, to build the inverters and that kind of thing. So we'll do some device physics, but it won't be as detailed. So don't try to sort of cram those equations. Don't, don't try to cram the equations because you won't need them. I won't ask anybody to write some, any kind of equation device equation, the, obviously you have to remember the KCLs and the KVLs and those integrations, but for the devices themselves, um, yeah, it's, it's not necessary for this class. So I assume you did that for your first electronics class and that's sufficient. Okay, so we have that PN junction and then we have a p-type material, which has a majority of holes as the charge carriers. And then for the n-type material, you have a majority of free electrons as your charge carrier. So majority of electron, free electrons, and here you're talking about free holes as the charge carriers. Okay, so basically what happens, and I'll sort of, we look at a diagram is that when, okay, I'm talking it, uh, we're talking about joining, but okay, let's just call it joining. So when this is basically just being created, so when you're just creating that diode, we'll have electronics, electrons, sorry, free electrons diffusing across a PN junction. And then they'll come, okay, let's see. Let's just look at the diagram. Let's, will, let's just look at the diagram. Uh, okay, so let's look at this. So this is a PN junction. So when this is just basically being manufactured, so on this side, I've got a bunch of holes and basically I've got a bunch of electrons. So the end material has electrons. Um, what I've tried to do is to have sort of the same number on both sides. So I've got about six holes on this side and I've got like six, sort of six, forget that dot. So about six electrons. So what I'm trying to show is that it's sort of kind of balanced. So I've got electrons on this side, free electrons on this side and three holes on that side. 
And so when, wait, okay. Okay, okay, okay. There's something, okay, what I'll do. There's a step missing. Okay, we can use the reverse bias. Anyway, since you already know this, anyway, so when it just forms, you'll have a bunch of electrons flowing from the N layer towards the P layer, and you have a bunch of holes moving from the P layer to the N layer. So just sort of assume it's not reverse biased yet. So with that movement, so as the electron moves to this side, it leaves behind a positive ion. So anytime you have an electron crossing this junction, it's leaving behind positive ions on this side. And as the hole moves to that side, it leaves behind negative ions. So those are sort of the different colors. And then, so what happens is that basically you get to, at some point you get to sort of an equilibrium where basically the, for instance, these negative ions are sort of repelling any further movement of electrons from the N side to the P side. So this you're sort of familiar with already. So you end up with basically that so-called barrier voltage. So that barrier voltage that keeps everything, so at least minimizes the flow of electrons, minim sort of prevents them from freely diffusing from the N area into the P, the P layer, basically. So for that reason, you'll end up with a balance. So before you apply any of this um, potential difference, eh? so before you apply this, you'll have, you already have sort of a depletion area. And it's called a depletion area because it's depleted of freely moving electrons. So we, remember we talk about holes, but really it's, it's all about electrons. It's, it's really the electrons that are moving. But to make it sort of easier to understand, we talk about holes also crossing, but only electrons really move, but okay, that's okay. So you'll get to a point where basically you have this area that is more or less depleted of the free moving electrons or the holes. All you have are these ions, and remember the ions cannot move. So they don't move. So they are fixed in sort of their location. And so that creates a barrier voltage. And so you, we have this equilibrium where basically, if I have any holes going this way, then I sort of get the same amount of electrons going that way. So this area is sort of balanced. And so this happens basically as soon as this device has been created. Then, of course, we'll have what we ha what I've sort of drawn here, which is trying to operate this as a in having this be reverse biased. So to do reverse bias, I apply a positive voltage to the end side. So I apply this to the cathode and I apply a negative voltage to this side. So basically what's happening in this case is that now the negative, so basically the holes are being attracted towards a negative terminal and then the electrons are being attracted towards the positive terminal. So as this happens, this layer that is depleted of free electrons and free holes or the mobile ones becomes larger. So you have a larger depletion region. 
And so larger depletion mean, region means I can block a much larger voltage. So you have sort of, so for, for instance, for an electron to cross from this side to that side would be very, very difficult, extremely difficult. So that's the reason why now I can have a really, I can basically have a larger insulator. So remember that depletion region is basically the region that is acting like an insulator. So just a minute, just a minute. Okay, I'm back. Um, so why are we reverse biasing? We are reverse biasing cause we're trying to create an insulator. And so how do we create an insulator? We apply a negative voltage and we increase basically the size of this depletion region. The depletion region, as I said, is basically our insulator. So we said a large insulator means you can block a large voltage. So just imagine that I'm putting a large piece of wood in, in between basically this region. So there are hardly any electrons that are free to move around. So we can say that since we don't, we hardly have an electrons crossing this junction, then the current is basically zero. So basically we have, okay, there'll be a bit of a current, but it will be very small. So this is operating. So it, it looks like the switch is off. So remember I've got, um, you always have to have this, so normally when people draw this, they don't include this sort of resistor, but um, I always include it because it helps you limit the amount of current that flows. So it keeps everything, basically it prevents this from breaking down. Because one of the reasons you end up with breaking down where you have a very large current flowing. So to prevent that from happening, I put in a resistance, so sort of a resistor to make sure that I never have a very, very large current flowing, a current that is large enough for, even when this sort of gets into what would sort of be like breakdown, I limit that amount of current to sort of a small value. I hope that's clear, but this is something you've seen before. But again, what is unique is that now for this device, um, the depletion will happen more in the lightly doped end area than it will happen in the highly doped P region. So these regions, and I've, I've drawn this intentionally, so that this region is larger than that region. So you still have roughly the same amount of ions, <coughs> sorry. We have roughly the same amount of ions on each side, but because anyway, on this side, you started with fewer electrons anyway, is why this region, this side is larger. So most of the depletion will be in the lightly end region. So to block a large voltage, I need this to be lightly doped and this has to be relatively large. So physically, even, even physically, these will be larger devices. So the, the power diode will be larger than um, a low power diode. I hope this makes some sense. Uh -huh. the, the challenge is nobody responds to anything. So this is reverse biased. Um, there's a small leakage current, as I said, as you know, 
even when it's um, reverse biased. So you have this small current flowing in that direction. So you can see that actually the current flows the wrong way. <coughs> okay, let's see. Okay, yes, it makes sense, okay. So you're going to have a small leakage current. So, and that happens. So you have that bit of current flowing that way. Okay, then, so this is a case when it's off. <coughs> Sorry. So when it's on, then we want to have forward bias. So for on, what do we want to see? So we apply a positive on that side and a negative on that side. And then that means the holes are now being forced to cross the junction. And same thing with the electrons are also being forced to cross. So that crossing, ah, okay, some, okay, this is wrong. So the current direction is wrong, actually. So we'll sort of make a correction for this. So current flows from, wait a minute, yeah. So the current should be flowing in that direction. So sorry about this. So make sure you, I forgot, I missed this one. Current has to flow the other way. <coughs> because the electrons are flowing from this direction. So the current can't flow in the same direction as the electrons. So the electrons are being repulsed from this terminal. Then, so you have a whole bunch of electrons flowing in that direction. So the effect of that is to have significantly large amount of electrons and holes within what was previously a depleted region. So basically what this means is that depletion region becomes smaller. It never really goes away, but it becomes smaller. So which means the voltage drop. So you, it's as if you have a really tiny insulator now in between. So imagine you have this really, really thin insulator. And so because you have that insulator, it means you have sort of a, you still have a bit of a resistance, which means you have a, you will still have to overcome a voltage. So you remember that normally for, for silicon and for relatively low power, not low, the low power devices, right? low power diodes, that was, that would be maybe 0 0.6 volts or something like that that even when this is on, you'd have a drop of about 0 0.6 volts, you remember, for a diode. For a power diode, because you have this lightly docked area, then that drop will be a bit higher. So instead of maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts drop, when it's forward biased, you will have something that's, that's like 1.5 volts. So you have a bigger drop, so you have more power dissipation when this is on. So remember that in this case, we are looking at very large currents. So if you have large currents, even a small voltage will be, a small voltage of 1.5 volts will kind of be a lot. So you'll have a relative large power dissipation. And then, so for that reason, you need to have a heat sink. So make sure you always have, for these kinds of devices that power diodes, you always have some kind of heat sink. You always have to cool it down cause you're generating a lot of heat, especially here at the junction, cause this is where the, most of the resistance is out here. So this, the temperature at this junction has to be limited to a certain value. And the manufacturer will tell you how hot this can be before your device fails. So you need a way to cool to cool the device so that this junction doesn't become very hot. If it becomes very, very hot, the device will fail. So make sure you have a, a sort of a heat sink, some piece of aluminum metal or with a bunch of fins, or maybe a fan to make sure that the temperature at this point doesn't go beyond 
basically what the manufacturer recommends. So this reduces, and like I said, it's 1.5 because, as opposed to 0 0.6, because of the light doping. So, but what you're getting is that yes, the, the voltage drop is maybe 1.5 volts instead of 0 0.6. But when it comes to blocking, I can say block 1.5, I can block one kilovolt. So that's a trade-off you make that I want to be able to block minus 1000 volts. So even if, I get a larger drop when this device is on, uh, that is not really as bad as, it's basically a fair trade-off that you can block a thousand volts, but when it's on, then the voltage drop is about 1.5. So that's sort of what you're doing. And the, re the reason, of course, you're getting this, and there's this thing called conductivity modulation the reason the resistance is actually falls this much again is because you have a, a whole bunch of now you have a, a bunch of holes and electrons in, within this layer which sort of another way of thinking about it it reduces the reduce the resistance of the lightly doped area because remember, when you talk about resistance, we are really talking about um, an absence of many electrons that are free to move around the surface, not the surface, within the device. So again, I've added this resistance to control the current. Um, there's a limit to how much current these devices can carry before they fail. So again, I'm putting in a sort of resistor to limit that current so that the device doesn't break down. So, so that you don't have a very, very large current that breaks down the device. So you always have to have some kind of resistor in there to control the current, to limit the current. Okay. So reverse bias, you have a large depletion region, hence large block voltage. Uh, you have a small reverse leakage current. So this device is leaky, it's lossy, sorry, because you have a voltage and a current at the same time. So make sure you, so the loss, okay, the, the, the power loss is smaller in this case. It's greater when you're forward biasing. So this is sort of, you've seen this IV characteristic before. So this is when it's forward biased. So when it's on, so this is what we call on. On is when you have a large current flowing. So this is still off. So I say generally for a, uh, for a power diode, this will be around 1.5 volts around here. And then, so once you hit the 1.5, then you can have current flowing. So current flowing means the switch is on. Current not flowing on this side means the switch is off. So you have a bit of a leakage, but the leakage is still small. Then you have that breakdown. So what makes it a bad diode is that this breakdown is at a very high value. So I said uh, for some devices, this can be minus 1,500 volts. So that is a, a big value. It means I can easily have minus 350 volts minus and that device will work perfectly. So I can have a sine wave that goes to minus 350 or minus 400 volts peak voltage and the device will still work perfectly. So on this side minus whatever voltage it will be off. And once I hit about 1.5, this device will switch and will have some current flow. So avoid the avalanche breakdown. So it's one of the reasons I included the resistor to limit this current to a relatively small value. 
because if it's not limited, this current will just grow, become larger and larger, and basically heat up, uh, heat up that device until it fails. So with the resistor, although this is not a good one to have, at least I, I can limit it to a small value so that it doesn't necessarily fail. So you need to be able to draw this current voltage characteristic. Then the other bit is that this is more of a linear relationship. It's not exponential. So you remember with the low power devices, this was sort of exponential. Um, for a power diode, this is not the relationship is not exponential. But remember what I said, um, I don't expect you to to sort of walk into an exam with sort of having crammed what this equation is, eh? what sort of like the equation uh, defining this current is. So it's not necessary for this class. Um, if you do a solid state electronics class, or then maybe you, someone would expect you to know that much. For this class, you don't need to know that equation. You just have to know what that you have this relationship. And this is on and this is off. So off zero current, on a large amount of current. So that's basically the key thing. Then there's a limit also to how much current you can have even on the positive side. If this becomes too big, the device will break down. So if somebody says, so the manufacturer will tell you, let's see if, okay. Okay, what do you mean by heat sink? Okay, 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 that, that was covered. Okay, so, um, so, okay, the heat sink, that was covered. Eh? So heat sink is going to be a piece of, aluminum cable, like an aluminum plate that is attached to your diode at the back of the diode. So to keep, to sort of, um, to conduct the heat away from the device. So to keep that PN junction relatively cool, you need to find a way to remove the heat. So it's a heat conductor, that's what the heat sink is. So it sort of pulls, it's a sink for the heat. So it, it sort of drains the heat away from the device, that's what a heat sink is. Okay, um, I said what I hadn't included, even on this positive side, there's a limit to how much current. So if the manufacturer says you can have a maximum of a thousand amps, if you try to run 2000 amps through the device, it will fail. So again, another reason you need to have that resistor in there to make sure that, okay, if, the, if my manufacturer says I have to limit to 1000 amps, then make sure you never have anything greater than 1000 amps running through this device. Otherwise it will heat up because you have a voltage. So you have this IV, so although this voltage is small, 1.5 is not zero. So at some point, 1.5 volts times whatever current you have will be so large that this device will fail. So you have to limit the current on this side and on this side as well. Otherwise, so there's another breakdown, another breakdown on this side. Normally it's not shown, but there's a breakdown on the positive side and the negative side. So current, it's a unidirectional device. Okay, so there's an example. Um, you should look this one up. Eh? It's called a Vichy. It's made by a company called Vichy. It's uh, 100, 150U. So for that device, so when the device is on, it can carry 150 amps. So that is a significantly more than that the normal diodes we see, which carry maybe 10 milliamps. So most of the diodes, so the low power diodes will carry maybe 10 milliamps. So you can say 150 amps is a big value and it can block a negative voltage 
of up to 1.2 kilovolts. So you have minus 1.2 kilovolts to a block. So you can see why basically these are called power devices. The kind of voltage you're blocking, kilovolts, that's, this is not the kind of voltage you'd find in your house, unless you have a welding machine or something like that. Most people don't have welding machines in their houses. So generally these are not all the old style televisions, but generally these are not the kinds of voltages you'd see. So this is more of industrial type application. So this kind of thing you'd see in a factory, or like I said, in a welding machine, if you're welding something, um, you're, you're building burglar proofing sort of things for someone's windows, then yeah, these kinds of voltages you have to generate. And then the current is also very large, 150 amps is a large current. So remember for a home, 30 amps is considered a large current. So, so when I look at my plugs and my sockets, they always tell me that um, don't, I mean, keep the current down to maybe 15 or 13 amps. So again, 150 amps, that's sort of the industrial type current also. So make sure you check out this device. And uh, it's one of them. I picked it intentionally because these numbers are relatively big. They're obviously big. So this kind of thing you can get from a bad device. So uh, that's all I have for today. So the next one will sort of be a physical meeting because I think we are opening up again in November. So next, next, next week, next Thursday will definitely be in November. So nothing for tomorrow. So most of the stuff I'll, I'll have, I'll put up on uh, Muele. Um, I'm recording this. I don't know where I'll put it. So we we'll have to figure out a way to share this, the recording. Um, because now it's being saved to my to my drive. It's being saved locally. So we'll have to find sort of a link to this. Or, or when the university opens up to students officially, then you can share this video. Any questions before? <clears throat> so We've basically covered the power dials. The next thing would be the power BJT. Any questions? Innocence mic is on, so maybe. <coughs> Does that mean Innocent has something to say or? No, no. You don't have anything to say? I don't have anything, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so I'll see you. Yeah, I'll probably see you next week eh, on Thursday. Um, I'm so, only six people handed in the assignment, which was sort of strange, but okay. So the assignments to a large extent, I can put those on Mwele. I hope everybody has access to Mwele. Sometimes it's problematic, but I hope you have access to it. So watch the videos as well, the videos I put up. Um, there's one on these diodes. Um, it's a bit advanced, so, but okay. If you have some free time, you can watch it, but I think it's relatively that. It goes much deeper into the electronics than I do. Um, so generally, I don't care about the equations. Um, um, but yeah, you, you can sort of watch that one also. But like I said, I won't ask you any questions about those, the, those equations. Okay, so, okay, I'll see, so I'll see you next time, so, okay.